Welcome to this session on pediatric radiology. I'm Joseph Owen, and today we will be discussing endotracheal tube placement in infants. At the end of this session, you should be able to recognize the ideal and suboptimal locations for endotracheal tubes in pediatric patients, and also recognize some common complications that can arise from misplacement. So where does the endotracheal tube need to terminate? Generically, it needs to terminate between the thoracic inlet and the carina, so below the vocal cords, but above the bifurcation of the trachea into the bronchi. Ideally, it would be positioned approximately one centimeter above the carina, and this location will be slightly lower when the neck is flexed, and it'll appear slightly higher when the neck is extended. But how do we determine where the carina is? Usually the carina is between T3 and T5, typically at the T4 vertebral level. So we often want that endotracheal tube tip to be just above T4. So let's look at the anatomy. Here we have a premature infant. You can see that they have diffuse lung disease. They also have cardiac enlargement. We can see the endotracheal tube here. It is defined by two lines with an angular tip. When we try to judge where that tip is located, first we can number the vertebral bodies. So I have numbers here for reference. These are vertebral bodies T1, 2, 3, and 4. When we try to assess the location of the carina, you can see faint impressions of the bronchi as lucencies over the cardiac margin. We then see that the carina is at approximately the inferior end plate of T4 in this patient. We can then draw some reference lines, so the superior end plate of T1, the inferior end plate of T4, and we see that the tip of this catheter nicely terminates right about here, okay, so at the T2, T3 level, and that is appropriately positioned above the carina and below the thoracic inlet. Here's another case, slightly different positioning, a little bit older child, again, diffuse lung disease, cardiomegaly. This child does have a peripherally inserted central venous catheter terminating in the superior vena cava. There is also a gastric tube coming down and into the stomach. But when we start to assess the location of the endotracheal tube, which is here, okay, we are going to want to, again, number the vertebral bodies. Here we have T1 through 5. Then we think about where is the impression of the carina. So I can see an impression of the bronchi here. I can see a little bit of an impression of the bronchi there. Okay, So these are tough to see, and that's why sometimes using the vertebral bodies is the best guide. But the, the bronchi, if we outline the inner margins of the bronchi, fall roughly there. So again, pretty close to that T4 level, um, sort of right in the center of that T4 vertebral body. Now, superior implant of T1, inferior implant of T4. We can see that our endotracheal tube is just above T4. Maybe it's a little low, but it is still above the carina, and I think it would be in an acceptable position as long as the ventilation settings don't indicate something is abnormal. Now look at this case. So this is a very premature baby, diffuse granular lung disease. In this case, the heart is normal in size. We do see a gastric catheter here coming down and into the stomach, okay? And then we can identify our endotracheal tube. Now, when we look at that endotracheal tube just right off the bat, it looks high. Um, so if we, again, make our markers on our vertebral bodies, we can then see a little bit better than the last patient, these lucent impressions of the bronchi here and here, okay? And again, let's just mark those with our blue arrows. We can now see that the carina in this patient really falls more at the inferior margin of the T3 vertebral body. Okay, so we've got T1, we've got the inferior margin of T3. So as long as our endotracheal tube is somewhere in that region, we'd feel okay. So this is definitely high outside of that thoracic inlet and needs to be repositioned. Now let's look at another case. My initial impression of this case is that the endotracheal tube is too deep. Again, we assess the lines and tubes. We can see a gastric tube going down into the stomach in appropriate position. When we outline our endotracheal tube, we can see that it goes a bit lower than we have been seen on the prior exams. Okay, again, those two lines with that angular tip. When we label our vertebral bodies, one, two, three, four, five, and six, we see that the tip of this catheter is really at that sort of five, six vertebral level, and we know that that's gonna to be too low. When we go to assess the impressions of the bronchi to determine the location of the carina, we can see the right main stem bronchus here, 
the left main stem bronchus there, again placing the carina roughly at the T4 inferior implant. We can see the superior implant of T1, inferior implant of 4, so that's where we want our catheter to reside, and this endotracheal tube is in the right main stem bronchus. And right main stem bronchus intubation is one of the most common locations for a deep endotracheal tube to extend into. And when that right main stem bronchus is intubated, you can cause collapse of the left lung. And if it's deep enough, you can also sometimes see right upper lobe collapse. Here's a case of another child with a deep endotracheal tube. You can see the tube here. We can see the vertebral bodies labeled one through six, and we can see that this tube is actually near the inferior implant of T6. We look for our impressions to determine the carina, again, falling right around T4. Okay, and so this catheter is much too low. And notice that due to the right main stem bronchus intubation, we have complete opacification of the left hemithorax. We also have relative volume loss in the left hemithorax compared to that right hemithorax with leftward mediastinal shift. So this is a right main stem bronchus intubation with left lung collapse. Here's the final example we're gonna look at today. Again, right off the bat, this feels low to me. We can see, again, our gastric catheter extending down into the stomach. We outline our endotracheal tube. And then we label our vertebral bodies one through six. We mark the impressions of our bronchi. And we can see, again, the carina ending at approximately T4. So ideally, we'd have our catheter placed between these two yellow lines. And this catheter is beyond the carina. What's interesting in this case is that the catheter does not seem to be curving down into the right main stem bronchus, and it doesn't seem to be curving down into the left main stem bronchus. Instead, it is staying midline, and by going past the carina in the midline, we have to be concerned that there is an esophageal intubation. And in fact, this was an esophageal intubation. Luckily, it was recognized relatively quickly, and the tube was removed and replaced. One problem with esophageal intubation is that clearly you're gonna have very poor ventilation, right? The, the child will not be, the lungs will not be ventilated. And you will also start to see progressive gastric distension. And that gastric distension predisposes the patient to reflux and aspiration. And if substantial enough gas fills the bowel, you can also get worsening abdominal distension and hypotension due to uh, progressive pressure or increased pressure within the abdomen that reduces venous flow. So in summary, you want that endotracheal tube tip one centimeter above the crina. The T2 or T3 level is generally acceptable if you can't find your other landmarks. The right main stem bronchus is the most common mouth position, aside from maybe a highly high position tube above the thoracic inlet. And when you have right main stem intubation, you're at risk for left lung collapse and right upper lobe collapse. If you see the endotracheal tube pass beyond the carina, at midline and it doesn't follow the course of one of the bronchi, you have to be worried about esophageal intubation. And that can be an emergency due to the patient receiving very poor ventilation or no ventilation, right? Because you've intubated the esophagus and the potential for gastric distension and aspiration. I hope you found this session helpful. Thank you for your time. And I hope you will review the other videos on lines and tubes in pediatric patients.